Joe and Lisa with Jolie Farms in Ecuador. Welcome back to the channel. We just want to start today by thanking everyone for tuning in, watching all of our videos and all the thumbs up and subscribes. We appreciate all your comments. Thank you so much. Today we want to bring you kind of a different video. We're going to talk about eight tips for newcomers to Ecuador. So these tips, I think you'll find some of them very handy. If you'll heed some of our um, warnings to you and some of our suggestions, I think you'll settle into Ecuador quite nicely. So should we get started? We should get started. And right. these are not in any particular order. They're just random thoughts put down. Um, the first one is learn the culture. Yeah, most definitely. I think, um, you know, there's so many things about the culture I think that's important. And, and you kind of have to forget the culture that you've come from if you really want to enjoy Ecuador and start noticing the differences in this culture and becoming part of this culture. Yeah, I'll say before we came, I even went um, and found some books on culture differences in Ecuador and learned about the culture in the mountain regions versus the coastal regions. Um, get a little bit of history on Ecuador in general and it'll help you understand the people here and what they value. Ecuadorians place, you know, significance on things differently than say North Americans. Um, for example, very high on family and not as much on money as North Americans would be. Family time and family is much more important. Yeah, they their views on, and th this is here in Vilcabamba, I'm not going to say it's everywhere, but um, it's a more impoverished area than what you probably are coming from. Um, but it's also so laid back that they just don't do the hamster wheel like we do in the States to where it's just running from one project to the next just to get more money, more money, more money and to buy more material things. That's just not the culture here. We have an American friend here in, in Vilcabamba that's lived here a long time. And when I first came here, he would tell me, you and your American ideas. And it would make me so angry uh, because I felt like there were just logical ideas, not necessarily American. But I think you have to understand that your ideas are not necessarily better than theirs. Um, yeah. This is the way that they do things here, uh, the way that they live here. And the faster you accept that and come into agreement with them, the happier you'll be. Yeah, the first year we were here, we um, just watched. We watched the people, we watched the culture, and uh, I think you get a better appreciation for all of it when you can understand where they're coming from. So to kind of tag on to that, the number two tip is learn the language. I know it may be tough and it's hard for me, uh, especially with my hearing uh, deficiencies. It makes it a little harder for me to understand them, but do your best to learn the language even just starting out with some of the basic, you know, greetings. Well, I think that's it, is you learn it in small chunks. Greetings um, uh, is probably one of the first things you do. If you eat in the restaurants at all, the, the second one that you do is learn how to communicate the food items on a menu or how to ask for a drink or, you know, those type of things. And it just eases you into learning the language a little bit more. Yeah, I think, you know, I told somebody just this week, um, learn the alphabet. Yes. Because when you're in a business transaction or something, they're asking your last name. Um, you know, it can be very difficult for them to understand some of our last names, just like it would be for us to understand theirs. So the ability to be able to spell it, you know, uh, the A's and E's and how they're pronounced. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's much easier to learn the Spanish alphabet and be able to spell your name, at least be able to spell your name. And I think that will help you when you're dealing with people at the bank or just wherever it might be. Well, the alphabet and your numbers, but also I think Spanish is definitely more of a phonetic language. So if you get the alphabet down really well, you're going to do a lot better. And there's a couple of programs that we recommend if you want to start at home now. Uh, Duolingo is a good one, certainly. Um, Lisa uses one called Lingo Pi, P-I, right? Lingo P-I? I think so. 
Yeah, I think it's Lingo Pi, Lingo Pi. Um, so, uh, you know, that's a really good one. And, I, you know, you can start this right now and, and your Google Translate is going to get you only so far. Uh, but start working on the very basic things. Yeah, and I will say too, as you're learning it, if you're doing it before you come, um, Duolingo has um, some exercises that you can do where you can see the words. There are a lot of letters and words that are very, very similar. <laughs> yeah. So if you can see them written down, it really is going to help. I will say I also did, uh, oh, another one that was a full CD set. And I got into it and it was like, well, that word's the same as this word. So, you know, which one is it? But, and like the word C is yes. We all know that one, but it's also if. So being able to see them and seeing that there's an accent mark there that may differentiate a couple of the, the words will really help you. I struggled in the beginning. Um, I had a worker here who didn't speak any English. And the, the subtle differences, for, for example, your V's are pronounced like a B. So Vilcabamba is actually Vilcabamba. Mm -hmm. YouTube always has a trouble with translating that. So um, the words um, swimming pool would be piscina and the word neighbor would be bacina. <laughs> so I was confusing the swimming pool with a neighbor wanted to talk to me. I, so it was very confusing <laughs> because bacino is spelled with a V, but it's pronounced like a V, bacino. Yes. And so here I am going, why do you want me to go to the swimming pool? Mm -hmm. And it took me a few minutes to understand that. Oh, you want me to talk to the neighbor? Okay. Um, so, you know, that's it's learning these little differences is yeah. very important. And I, I think learning the social, um, you know, the things that are socially important, like if you're going to sit down for a business meeting, don't just jump into your question or, or jump right into business. It's always best to sit down and ask, you know, give them the proper greeting, ask about how their family is doing, you know, uh, familiar as being at a minimum and um, yeah. you know that's a big change from the way things are in the states is uh usually it's business 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 you're going as fast as you can and you don't have time to really learn about the people you're talking to here that's the most important part and so and it also helps you when you're learning to slow down because this is a much slower paced culture and so they're not worried about getting from point A to point B as fast as they can on every second of the day. It's much calmer. And when you take the time to stop and talk to somebody, it slows you down, which is usually pretty, pretty much needed when you get here. Yes. And I think, you know, this, this tranquilo mindset is what I call it. Getting into the tranquilo mindset and understanding things don't happen at a rapid pace here. So slowing down and asking about someone's family and how are things going, you know, how's your health? Um, these type of things are more important than doing business. Yeah. Business is going to be secondary. Now, we're making some generalizations about Ecuadorians, but um, each region is going to be a little different. Mm -hmm. However, most of these things are going to hold true. And I think um, you'll do well if, if you heed the advice we're giving you here. Yeah, and, and we're saying that's a cultural thing here, but it's probably a good practice worldwide to just slow down and, and care more about the people around you. So number three, tip three, um, learn how to navigate the mercados and tiendas. This would be your third section of what to learn in Spanish. Yeah. So a mercado, um, mercado is like a farmer's market and... Mm -hmm. um, so when you go to the Mercado, you need to understand ahead of time. Um, and the way you're going to learn these things is by talking to other um, gringos or, mm. or whatever you want to call them. But um, so uh, people who've lived here a while are going to be able to tell you some of these things and the important things about pricing. Um, we believe that um, you need to learn what things sell for so you know what to expect. Um, if you go in and, and start to pay too much for things or, 
or try to get into a negotiation. There may be some hurt feelings on either side. So let's avoid all that. Learn what things uh, cost. Learn what to ask for. Um, if you're vegetable shopping, learn the names of the vegetables. Um, mm. And yes, broccoli is still broccoli. Um, but there are other vegetables, cucumbers or pepinos. Yeah. Um, learn these types of things. Yeah, it's it's a good thing to learn. And, and I guess our background is in farming. So we know farmers don't make a ton of money anyways. Well, they're definitely not making a lot of money here. So if something costs a dollar, for heaven's sakes, give them a dollar. Um, now you may go to somebody else and they may want to charge you a dollar fifty for the same thing. If you know what it is, just turn around and walk away and say thank you, but that's okay. Um, and that way you keep things in the right um, price range because it's not about you. It's about not letting things get out of the market to where other Ecuadorians can't can't afford to buy things. So we, you know, I, I think one of the things that I've seen happen here is um, someone new to Ecuador will go to the Mercado and somebody's charging a dollar fifty for a bro head of broccoli instead of a dollar, um, and they'll get angry with them and try to talk them down. And I, I really think the better solution is to smile and say no thank you and walk away. Mm -hmm. And it, if they want to lower their price, they will come chase you down. And they'll, yeah. they'll tap you on the shoulder or they'll say, Senora, Senora, um, you know, and then they'll say, Un dollar. Um, okay, you know. And so uh, I, it's not a tactic. I'm just saying it's a better practice. So if they don't want to lower their price, they don't have to. Um, yeah. And I'm not going to fault them for 50 cents, but I do think that knowing the price of things is very helpful. It is. And a lot of people, when you get here, they go, Oh, where well, they're going to gringo gouge you or something like that and charge you more. I have not found that to be so. Um, now, before we came here, long before we came here, we tend to shop with people we like. I mean, that's just been our practice, whether it's going out to eat or buying things, what have you. Um, so we do have our preferred vendors, but they're, they're very honest people. They work hard for what they're selling. And, you know, sometimes I buy stuff not because I need it, just because I want to support someone. Um, but there are people that have never tried to take advantage of us. And so we just do business with them. And when times are tough, we do what we can to buy their goods and to help them out. So our, you know, I, I think one of our goals is for the vendors to be glad to see us yes. and not because we're spending money, but glad to see us because they know we're nice, polite people who appreciate what they're doing. And we care about them as an individual. See. All right, so tip number four is eating in restaurants. <laughs> understanding typical Ecuadorian cuisine and the menu yeah. and understanding what almorezo is. So um, lunch here is typically called almorezo, but it's also, it's their special of the day, if you will. So they'll list on a board a lot of times out front of the restaurant um, and they'll have a soup, they'll have a, a main um, uh, dish, and that'll usually include rice or plantain or yuca or something on there, some type of carbohydrate. A whole lot of carbohydrates. Yeah, yeah, a whole lot of carbohydrate. Uh, it'll be some beef or chicken or pollo. You tell them what you want. Mm -hmm. um, and then you'll have a little, sometimes a little tiny dessert will come with it. Mm -hmm. And you'll get a glass of some kind of juice with that. Mm -hmm. Now, commonly, depending on the region, that's anywhere from $2 to $4. So somewhere in that range is what lunch is going to cost. And that's a, a pretty generous lunch. Well, that's that's assuming you take the lunch special. And I think it's, you know, a really smart way of um, having a restaurant is you you fix whatever is available. So here they cook regionally. They cook on whatever is available at the time. And that becomes their lunch special. And as long as you fit within that lunch special, I mean, it's a very reasonable price. You can order from the menu. It will take you a little bit longer to get it, but um, they cook it fresh and it's whatever they have available during that time of the season. Yes. And I think don't be concerned because someone else has got their food before you because that's that's what can happen mm -hmm. um, is they're ordering now, so you're ordering off the menu. That's going to take you longer. That's right. And also, um, you know, this was told to me before I ever moved to Ecuador, 
and it is true. Here in Vilcabamba, though, they're starting to understand the Americans and what our expectations are a little bit. So they, they have adjusted a little here. But in other parts of Ecuador, if you sit down, you order a beer with your meal, you may not get that beer till the end of the meal. Um, and, and you're getting frustrated, will only take it longer to get there. That's right. So, um, you know, be polite and maybe ask again, cerveza, por favor. And, you know, just uh, understand that sometimes it's a little longer. Here in Vilcabamba, they, they understand that cerveza is very important to me, so they bring <laughs> it right away. Now, if you're ordering a bottle of water, that may be a little different. <laughs> yeah, the water they tend to bring right away. Um, so one of the things that we had decided it was important, go on dog, get out of here. Okay, start over. The dogs. <laughs> yeah. Okay, one of the things that we thought might be uh, important when we moved here was we kind of made a pact that it was important for us not to be negatively affect the economy. Mm. And this is what I recommend to a lot of newcomers here. Make it your goal to not to negatively affect the economy. Well, what does that mean? Well, if I pay double what something's worth, um, that gives the expectation that it has more value and that now they can charge more because I've had one or two people pay more. So now you've negatively affected the economy because the same Ecuadorian comes to buy the same thing and he has to pay double like you did. He's not going to be very happy. We yeah. hear a lot of times that um, foreigners drive up the prices of houses and land here. Well, there may be some truth to that, but there's also a lot of truth that an Ecuadorian set that price to begin with and somebody Ecuadorian benefited from that. So I will say that paying too much for real estate, you're not being a smart shopper, but you're also not helping the Ecuadorian economy. Um, you need to be a positive thing for this for this mm -hmm. country uh, if you move here. Well, and markets change, prices go up, prices go down. But wherever you are in the world, just be conscientious of what you're doing. I mean, we're from Texas and uh, people from California are moving into Texas and paying double and it's making it really difficult for everybody else in Texas. So this is a global thing. I mean, you really don't don't bring your your pricing ideas here. Come and investigate for yourself and see what they are. And just like with the Mercado, if you investigate real estate, find out what the true selling prices really are. Mm -hmm. um, you won't make those mistakes and, and just be slow and patient about it. Don't rush over here thinking you're going to buy property the very week that you come. Spend yeah. a year, spend six months at least and really be sure you understand the area that you're looking at and where you want to live. And, you know, kind of piggybacking with the restaurant theme too is, is negatively affecting the economy here is tipping. Um, people come here and want to tip 15, 20% like in the States, and that's the wrong thing to do. Um, one, culturally, for some people, it can create this barrier that you're different than they are once you start to tip. Mm -hmm. And we want to be the same as they are. We want to be friends with them. We want, we're on the same level. We're not a different caste, if you will. Yeah. And tipping can cause a problem there. Um, so I tip in certain places, but very little. Um, there are places where you just absolutely do not tip. One of the things that's happened here in Bilcabamba, I think, since we've been here, you're seeing more and more tip jars on the counter that didn't used to be there. Yeah. Because Americans are always going, I need to tip. Where do I put the tip money at? Mm -hmm. And so um, be very, very careful with that. Um, there are people who say, oh, I've got the money. I want to help them. There are better ways to help Ecuadorians if you want to help Ecuadorians. Definitely. There's a lot of ways you can help an Ecuadorian. Um, you can help the, the country. You can help the area that you're in. Some friends of ours painted a whole town. I mean, there's a lot of ways you can do it, and it's not necessarily handing out money. That's correct. Um, and, you know, I would say no matter what country it is, even in the U.S., just giving away money is never a good thing. Um, it, putting money to work in the right places is always a good thing. Um, but being 
having that discernment to know what's right and what's not good. Well, that comes back to the number one, learn the culture. But you can invest in people and you can help them achieve their goals. Um, you can help them, guide them. I mean, there's a lot of ways you can do that. Money's not the answer to everything, especially here. And that's hard to say when, you know, they're earning $20 a day. Mm -hmm. You know, a dollar tip means a lot. Um, so I'm not saying don't tip. I'm just saying be judicious. Well, and, and be like we have people that come and help with the grounds. Um, the gardens, when they produce, we share the goods. When the rabbits produce, we share the goods. So there's a lot of ways of helping people. And just investigate them, investigate the culture, and see what they really want to do. Because if you just want to give away money, just go buy a bunch of beer and you can hand it out on the You'll corner of the friends. street. <laughs> While you have the beer, you can. Yeah. And money's the same way. They'll be your friend as, as long as you're handing out. And then they're not a true friend. So. Okay, so tip number six um, is prepare for inconveniences. If you're um, not used to being inconvenienced, well, Ecuador may be a challenge for you. Maybe a good challenge. Yeah. Again, it's getting off the hamster wheel from where you came from and really slowing things down. Um, it's not as, um, everything's not done as in lockstep as you might be used to. Um, things are done as they are needed. Uh, be prepared to stand in line. That's a, a big one. Yeah, I, I love to share the experience of getting our car matriculated with the first car we bought. So luckily we took a translator with us. Mm -hmm. And that's a good idea, even if you know some Spanish, um, is to take someone who understands the process. In our video of buying a used car in Ecuador, Santiago would be an excellent choice to do that. He knows the process forward and backward, and he's going to make that go a little easier for you. We were lucky we did have a good translator with us. So we go to the place where they do the car inspection, matric matriculation, all the paperwork. And so, um, you know, it takes two days to get this done, two full days. So, you know, the first day, Lisa and I are there and we go stand in this line to get this done. And then you go stand in that line to get a little other signature place yep. done. Then you go over there and somebody staples your papers together and then you go to the next line. And so I'm sitting there in a chair and I'm watching all this happen. And there's like 20 people doing the job of what one person would probably do in the U.S. because of computerized systems in right. the U.S. So um, I'm, I'm shaking my head and, and I go home and I'm thinking about this all evening. And I finally came to the conclusion, yay, 20 people have a job. That's right. And that is an awesome thing. And just because it's done differently in Texas, there's no reason for me to criticize how it's being done here. Mm -hmm. This is a great process. It's checks and measures set in place for a right. reason. When you get ready to pay for something, you have to go either across the street to a bank mm -hmm. where you pay or a specialized window <laughs> because they're trying to cut down on thievery and corruption and things like that. Mm -hmm. So they have a lot of these systems set in process that may be totally tr invisible to you, but they're important here. Well, and I would say banking. I mean, we, we stand in line at the bank a lot, but um, a lot of people are afraid of banking in a foreign country. I will say the security at the banks here and the online banking process is far better than what we had in the States. I mean, he could sign Batman on a check and nobody would bat an eye and the check, you know, would clear the bank. Here, they really pay attention to your signature. Boy, did I learn that the hard way. Yeah, the just the online um, verification process. I mean, the, the U.S. is behind the curve. I mean, they've really got a lot more going on here in security. And Lisa mentioned something that's a, an absolute goes to the culture. So I, I used to, yeah, at the bank in Texas, sign Batman, Superman, whatever I felt like that day. And, you know, I'm sure somebody somewhere got a giggle out of it. Um, and I'd scribble my name. Before we moved here, we had to renew our passports. Lisa handed me a form. I scribbled my name, handed it back to her. So when I came down here and opened up a bank account, there I go, no, sir, um, the signatures don't match. And I'm like, mm -hmm. 
I have to recreate that scribble. And, <laughs> and it's like, they made me practice for an hour. Yes. And, and I finally, I'm like scratching my head. They finally sent out a guy who spoke pretty good English. And he went, um, Mr. Schramm, they're looking for those three upstrokes. Don't worry about the spelling. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, okay. So I managed to recreate the three upstrokes. Everybody's happy. No more problems. So Lisa tells people I'm not allowed in the bank anymore. She does all the banking <laughs> because my signature is so bad. Well, and if we go back to culture again, they really respect older people. So if you're over 65, even though there's long lines, they have a special line for over 65 people. I, so, do, I, st I get to stand in the special line. Yeah. So, uh, you know, good and bad, but it's, again, learning the culture, respecting the elders, um, helping people when you need to, you know, when they need help on the street and that type of thing. And what do I care? There's a line. Um, I'm retired. I got time. A lot of that's just letting go of the hamster wheel in the U.S. So other inconveniences you're going to find here are landslides. Um, when it rains real hard during the rainy season, some of these mountains will come tumbling down and will block the road. Mm -hmm. And so um, if you're in a hurry to get to the airport in Catamayo, um, guess what? You may have to go tomorrow. Well, um, taxi drivers are pretty good at knowing all the different sideways to get around there. Yeah, they all have their own little routes, but- They do. So, you know, sometimes that does happen. It hasn't really happened to us where we couldn't go where we wanted to go, but there are times when, when it's rained, a torrential rain, I'll call a taxi driver I know and say, how are the roads between here and Aloha? Yeah. Oh, they're fine. Go right ahead. You know, uh, we went down the, the road to our friend's house the other day after a torrential rain. And so we followed a bus because there was rocks all over the road and the bus driver's assistant would get out in front <laughs> of us, move all the rocks for us, yeah. get back on the bus. So we followed the bus where we needed to go. It was good. Now, two hours, two and a half hours later, we come home. The road's completely cleaned up. Yeah. And that's that's the case most of the time. Um, when, like we've gone through a couple of years of heavy rain, and it may be that there's just so many slant landslides, it's taken them a little bit longer to clean it up. But for the most part, they clean it up pretty fast. Um, I would say expect there to be uh, water outages. Mm -hmm. um, the water does go out here. The landslides will take out a water line, and so they've got to repair it. And for us, you know, our water comes from way up high in the Podocarpus Park. And um, for them to get up where the storage tanks are up there, it's like a half a day walk up there. And it's, yeah. it's pretty, pretty treacherous. So um, understand that when you're being inconvenienced by the water being out. My suggestion is make sure you have water storage so that you're not quite so adversely affected by that. Um, same thing, electricity does go out here from time to time. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't affect us that much, really. Uh, no. The internet will go out. Uh, we haven't had an internet out outage in quite some time, and this week yeah. it went out two different nights in a row. Yeah. One day was out about six hours, the next day was out maybe two hours. Yeah, there's those type of things that are going to happen, and, and you just have to learn wherever you move to prepare for those things so that when they do happen, you have a backup plan in some way. And, you know, I think one of the things, too, for people moving, especially from North America, you're used to a certain level of, of customer service. Um, I would say get rid of that idea and understand customer service is going to be different here. Um, again, it's a totally different idea about it here. Not that there's not good customer service here and it can be found, but don't expect it to be quite the same. It's going to be different. Don't expect it, but when you receive it, be very happy. Yes. And there are good people you can work with here, contractors, etc. Mm -hmm. If you look on our website, there's a list of those people who are great at customer service, who are trustworthy, and who are not going to relieve you of your money unnecessarily. Mm, true. All right. So number seven. This is my favorite. <laughs> Go ahead. Don't be on time. If you're invited to a party, um, and this has happened to us, the second time it happened to us, I'm like, okay, I've learned my lesson. Uh, hey, the party starts at 12 and, and we're gonna have lunch and yada, yada, yada. So we show up at 12. We're the only ones there. 
Yeah, you go thinking you're going to get lunch. Hmm, not so much. Maybe 2 or 3 o'clock they'll start to serve lunch. Well, 2 or 3 o'clock they may start cooking lunch. <laughs> yeah, and that's kind of the way it is here. Um, you're not expected to be there at 12. You're expected to be there maybe 1 o'clock, 12, 30, 1 o'clock at best. Yeah. Um, don't, don't come right at 12. It's almost where in our former country, we would consider that being polite, being on time. Mm. Um, here, it's not looked at the same way. No, it's not. So when a contractor tells you they're going to be there at, um, in the morning, uh, I'm coming tomorrow in La Mañana. Okay, um, will you be here at 9? And if they go, um, yeah, <laughs> they're not going to be there. Um, if you say, will you be here at 9? Yeah, yeah, I'm going to be there sharply at 9. If they say something you know, to that effect, there's a good chance they'll be there by 9.30. It's kind of like dealing with the cable company or the phone company or something like that in the States. They'll be there at some point in time during the Between day. Between 12 and 5, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I think that's a better way to look at things. Understand, it may be, a, you know, uh, and, and the better ones, I think, are good at calling you and or texting you saying, I'm going to be late, I'm sorry. Um, and so that's always a great thing to respond with. Okay, well, look, if you're going to be late, just send me a WhatsApp text. And so I know. But that goes along with, again, the culture is because once you get here and people find out who you are and you make friends and you're going to go meet somebody for lunch, but on your way walking to wherever you're going to meet them for lunch, you see maybe five people along the way and they all stop you and have these long conversations Obviously, you're not going to be there when you said you're going to be there, but that happens all the time, all the time. And, and the relationships are so important here, I think, mm. especially family, um, that they're going to spend that time talking to whoever they need to. And, and you're not as important in their mind at that particular moment. And you have to understand, they don't think any less of you. At that moment, the person in front of them is most important to them. Well, and I think they view time differently than we do. We call it manana time. Um, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, we'll get to it tomorrow if we have to. And yeah, I mean, it'll all be here tomorrow. That's right. So getting in that tranquilo mindset and the manana time understanding, mm -hmm. um, you'll be a much happier person. And, you know, we can joke about it amongst each other. It, it's just, um, it's just the culture. It's the way it is here. Yeah. We find it different. It's very normal uh, in this country. And, People learn to not be so excited when these things happen and just go, okay, well, you know, there's landslides. People are late. Things happen. Yep. Um, and just embrace it. That's right. Embrace it. Okay. Number eight, be patient. That kind of tags on to what we were just talking about. It does. Patience is a virtue. And when you need to be challenged, move to Ecuador. <laughs> yeah. So expect to stand in line. Expect yeah. that when you go to do business, you know, government business, you know, any, any internet, business, whatever, expect that it may take more than one trip uh, mm -hmm. to get accomplished what you want to get accomplished. Uh, we used to say, boy, when we got in Aloha, if we had six items on our list, if we actually got four of them done, that was a great day. Yeah. Um, we're more efficient at it now because we know better places to go or you know, and, and how to call ahead for certain things. So um, it, it gets easier, but understand that it's going to take more time than it did from wherever you're from. Uh, it's going to take more time to get it done here. But that's okay. Like um, you said, oil, an oil change, he's got to take his car to the dealership for the oil change it takes three to four hours. That's just yeah. a great opportunity to be able to walk around town and to investigate new stores and find new things to do. Yeah, you know, so I, Thursday, I dropped my car off the dealership at 9 a.m. sharp. We're actually there about 15 minutes early. Dropped it off, and I said, you know, can we have it by noon? Uh, maybe, maybe 1 o'clock. Well, it was pretty cool because my friend and I are walking around in Aloha. We walked about six miles that day walking around. And so um, I get a, a phone call uh, from the girl at the dealership. Hey, your car is going to be ready in 10 minutes. And we're like, yay, and that was like at 12 o'clock. So we got there, and by the time we actually checked out, it was closer to one yeah. um, by the time we got it all done. Uh, but again, not in a hurry. I want to visit with the people at the dealership. Yeah. They're wonderful people. 
Um, and shout out to Auto Firma in Loja. Great <laughs> people to deal with. And uh, uh, really, Fernanda, yeah, love, love y'all. They're great people over there. So, um, you know, just uh, I know when I go to take my car into Loja for this oil change, it's going to take that long. So I plan to have a good time while they're doing that. Exactly. And that's just it is all these things that a lot of people see as inconveniences. Turn it around and look at it as an opportunity to go do something else, to um, experience something you haven't experienced before. Yeah. And if you're somewhere and they say, um, well, it's going to be a little while before I can get to it. Um, smile and say, how long should I expect to wait? So I know if I should go do some other shopping. And that kind of, you know, gives an expectation that you're going to expect it at a certain time. Yeah. And and they might be willing to move a little faster. Well, um, they might. I mean, it just, again, it depends on what's happening during that day. Did somebody come in that wanted to have a conversation? Uh, I actually look at it like doctors. In the U.S., you go to a doctor's office and you wait in the waiting room for a long time. And then they stick you in a room to wait for another long time. Here... You know, it's not, it's not, I, most doctors, I haven't seen that at all. It's been more efficient and, uh, they care about you. They actually, most of them listen to you and want to yeah. know what's going on in your life. And so it's far more personable. And when you take being more personable with people over the fact that there's a time constraint, life just gets better. Yeah, and I, I want to shout out to my eye doctor, Dr. Miyoto in Cuenca at uh, XE Laser. What a professionally run clinic. I, I got to tell you, they're breaking all the rules there. Because oh, I went there a few weeks ago, and uh, my friend Santiago was with me. And so you walk in, and you check in, pay your fee, and you sit down. And within a few minutes, here comes a girl who's putting drops in your eyes. And then here comes another gal who takes you in to see a doctor and they do all the eye tests and the pressure tests and stuff. And then you go sit down again in another area. And then here comes somebody else that takes you in and does a different eye test, you know. And then a few minutes later, you're sitting out in front of the big doctor's office, Dr. Miyoto. And so within a few minutes, she's taking you by the arm and taking you to see Dr. Miyoto. We're in and out of there in 20 minutes. So it was amazing. Now, I mean, I've waited as much as maybe an hour there. But rarely, I mean, they're in and out very quickly. They really, I would have to, I still say, the best run medical facility I've seen anywhere in the world. Yes, and you know, um, Dr. Miyoto is really a state-of-the-art facility. And when you're visiting with him, he has your eyeballs up on a big screen <laughs> that you can see. And he's pointing out certain things, uh, you know, going on. He's very thorough, goes into everything with you answers all your questions, never rushes you in and out. No. Um, he's there to make sure you feel comfortable with what's happening with your eye health. But, I mean, he's, he's wonderful. We've got a lot of doctors that we've seen here. All of them have, you know, they just care about people. And back the way it's supposed to be, caring about people. That's right. Right now I'm caring about my dog barking in the background. Yeah. She chooses at most opportune times to do this. She's been pretty quiet up till now. Yeah, she's, see, we were in town earlier. She's excited we're home. Well, Carnival, too, starts today officially. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of extra noise in town that she's listening to. Yeah, the fireworks will start tonight and the big loud bands and stuff. We'll hear some of it up here where we live, but not much. Not a whole lot. Um, yeah, so big time here. So, yeah, um, you know, those are our eight tips. We'll have more tips coming later. But we wanted to get started with some very basic things. Um, and, if, and if you really pay attention to what we're saying here mm. and, and practice some of these um, suggestions, and I think your experience in Ecuador is going to be great. Yes. Um, I promise you a week or two weeks stay here. Um, that's a very much a honeymoon, honeymoon period. <laughs> and, and you're not going to get a good feel for Ecuador. Six months here, you're going to understand the culture a lot better. And then after five years, you really start to figure it out. Yeah. Um, a lot of people don't make it but three years here. And they can't uh, deal with these differences from their culture. And they go home. There, there are a lot of differences. But you look at them as a new adventure or a new challenge. Or you look at them as complete inconveniences. And if they're that much of an inconvenience, then you're probably in the wrong place. 
we looked at ourselves as like pioneers or explorers in a new country. And uh, we, and I think that's why I like to walk around in Loja because I'm exploring. Oh, hey, there's a, there's a new shop I didn't know was there that's been there all along, but it's new to me. And look at all the things they carry. And you go in, there'll be a, like a 10 by 20 shop will be packed to the gills with stuff. It's and amazing. so it takes a while to understand everything they carry in that particular shop. And you get used to shopping like that. I've got to go six places instead of one. Um, there's not anything truly equivalent to like a Home Depot here. We do have a, some super stores called Kiwi uh, that, and, and one in Cuenca called Corral. Mm. Um, and those are like giant uh, Home Depots in a way. Yeah, but um, again, you go back to letting go of the time constraints and just walk around and enjoy it because it's amazing when you look at um, the culture here and the people here. And when they've had a tienda for a long time, oh my gosh, they have everything in that little bitty room. Now, if, you, if you're looking for something very specific, like I've been looking for a special light bulb, um, you know, they'll immediately, they'll, no, no, no. And so you asked them for, for a recommendation that you would look at, where would I look next, you know? Yeah. And so they'll make a recommendation, and um, sometimes it's a good one, sometimes it's not. But that's part of the fun. Well, if it's not, you, you get to go and investigate another tienda, which you may that's not have exactly known right. about. Yeah. So. You may have something else you need there in the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, those are our eight tips for newcomers to Ecuador. I hope you've enjoyed this. Hope you'll give it a thumbs up. Let us know in the comment section if you've got questions. We're happy to answer to the best of our ability. When it comes to pricing of real estate and things like that, reach out to the professionals. Yeah. They know better than we do. Uh, we have some general ideas, but, you know, prices on rentals and like that are, it's such a huge subject because um, when it comes to rentals, depends whether it's an apartment, a house, in town, out of town, which barrio it's located in, what size house, do you want it to look more European uh, standards or Ecuadorian standards? Does it have hot water? Yeah, does it have hot water or not? You know, there's, these are all just, it's just a mix mash of information there. Everybody has their things that they want to hang on to when it comes to renting a place. Yeah. You know, you always have special needs and you know, it just takes time to find them, but and slow be prepared down and to watch. compromise. That's right. That's right. All right, folks. Thanks so much for tuning in today. God bless you. See you next time.